Hi, good evening for thank you and thank you for joining us on Fade to Sosa. Here's the question. If you work 70 hours per week, which means about 11 hours for six straight days, are you working hard enough to build a strong nation? That's the question we're asking. And let me tell you why we're asking this question, if you don't already know. In a conversation with Mohan Daspai, his former colleague, Narayan Murthy said Indian youngsters who want to build something of value need to work or need to be prepared to work 70 hours per week. Now, this sparked a massive debate on the internet, of course, and everybody has something to say about it. And here's the interesting thing. A lot of those somethings were very valid, which sparked an interest in me and my team to actually put this debate together so we can actually talk about it because there are so many aspects to the number of hours we work and the number of hours we're expected to work. Now, Murthy got a lot of backlash for his statement. His wife, Sudha Murthy, responded in an interview separately and she defended her husband saying that he has worked 80, 90 hour weeks and he's only sharing his experience. Narayan Murthy is, of course, a software billionaire who started in forces back in 1981, 42 years ago, and he's, he remains chairman uh, emerges of the company. Now, for many, many people, Narayan Murthy built a legacy that continues to work today. He's generated a great number of jobs and a great amount of wealth for a lot of people. This is what he said exactly, so we don't take it out of context. He said, and I quote, India's work productivity is one of the lowest in the world. So my request is that our youngsters must say, this is my country. I want to work 70 hours a week. That's exactly what Germans and Japanese did after the Second World War. We need to work very hard. We need to be disciplined, improve our work productivity. Unless we do that, what can the poor government do? Now, in context, it's even more interesting. Does it imply that Indians are fundamentally lazy? Does it imply that our poor government is trying so hard and we're just simply not able to so, you know, sort of shoulder our end of the responsibility because we're not working hard? Apparently, in 2018, a study conducted by Kronos Incorporated uh, on international human resource management uh, basically said that Indians are the most hardworking people in the world, followed by Mexicans and then people, Americans from the US. Uh, Indians, incidentally, are also the most overworked and the most underpaid people in the world because in many, many of our jobs, there is no con uh, concept of overtime that you get paid if you work past the stipulated eight hours. Now, remember, labor laws say that you that a work day has to be eight hours with a one hour lunch break and two 10 minute breaks um, you know, in, in, in that day as well. So when we're talking about 11 hour days, six days a week, where does that fall in? There are also, of course, the consequences of working 70 hours continuously, burnout, uh, mental health, physical health issues because you don't have time to look after your health. Uh, what happens to those people who have young children to look after, who have elderly parents to look after? These people tend to very normally and very often be women. How are they possibly going to compete in this system that expects this kind of commitment? Now, and also the question of, do longer hours necessarily mean you're being more productive or are you drinking chai and talking politics and cricket for many, many hours before you schedule that meeting at 8 p.m. thereby showing that you have clocked a total of 11 hours in the workspace? The working population in India is among the highest in the world, which means that we have more people who want to work in this country, who are able to work in this country. Do we have enough jobs? So this whole, there is this idea, and I heard many people say it, even to me, uh, when I started my career, which is that if you don't work really hard, there are 10 people behind you ready to take your job. Those 10 people are competing for my job because there aren't enough jobs, not because I'm lazy. So. Is that a valid argument that to use to actually force people to work harder? There are many more, of course, very interesting arguments that came up on the Instagram question that I asked. And we've picked two of our panels, panelists this evening from Instagram, from the comments. And of course, we have several people who are logging in live as well. And we're going to read out those comments also. Let me introduce my panel right now. I have Rituparna. Uh, who joins us. Rutubarna Chakravarti is a co-founder of Team Lease Services. It's a, it, and she's sort of been a voice of sanity in the world of human resources and how India is sort of managing its people, Indian corporate India is managing its people. So I'm so happy she gave us time today. Advocate Sanjay Ghosh is a labor law advocate. Um, a brilliant mind when it comes to labor laws and it's important that we consider what the law tells us 
before we decide to sort of throw everything out because there's a danger when uh, business leaders start to romanticize the idea of a 70 hour work week and then your appraisals go out of whack because that is what they are starting to appreciate. Dr. Ira Datta is a consultant psychiatrist, um, you know, and uh, she's done an MD in, um, in psychiatry. And she actually commented on the Instagram post, which is how we found her. And she's bringing <laughs> in the mental health point of view. We'll also have Bani Nanda join us in a bit. She's a chef and uh, she, she'll talk about her personal experience of what it was like and what happened when she worked those hours. So we can get started. Before I bring in the panel, just a quick look at the comment section. Uh, Samyadev Rao says, pay 2,000 rupees an hour and people will work 90 hours a week. Uh, Rahul Kumar says, we're already working very hard. Nikhil Goswami says, employees should be compensated accordingly. Uh, Sheldi says, I like my sanity. I'm not giving it up. Give equity to employees. Positive Vibes says, this is just for his information. Many are working 70 hours with much less remuneration. Anish Kuria says, task-based work system is better than monitoring actual time put in. Um, and so we have these comments and more comments are coming in, but I want to start our conversation. And uh, let me start by, uh, you know, sort of bringing in Ritu Parna. Uh, Mr. Kruvati, thank you for joining us. Uh, your, your first reaction on hearing this, this demand, and like I was saying earlier, I feel that the challenge when business leaders start to idealize 70 hours is that when they then assess employees, they will use 70 hours as a base. And anybody who doesn't give 70 hours will then not be good enough. Yeah. Uh, Faye, please call me Ritu. And um, uh, thanks so much. And it's so good to be back on your show after quite some time. Uh, so I think uh, this is a topic that I'm sure everybody has a lot to say, and so do I. But I think the most important problem in this whole debate is that we're mixing way too many things. And one, of course, is that there is a, essentially messaging that has been done on urging youth and youngsters to work hard. And then somewhere that has been correlated to having influence over India's productivity gains and improvement. I think that's where the problem is. I'm somebody who myself have been a founder and I've worked 16, 17 hours a day. But my thing is, uh, or my submission here is that in India, uh, as the statistics or the data looks, working longer hours will not make India more productive. And mm -hmm. I'm telling you, even if for, for a minute, let's assume that all youth take cognizance of what has been said and starts working 70 hours a week, India will not become one of the most productive nations in the country because it's more than just hard work. There are a lot of other aspects which make India unproductive. And that's why what will happen is if we just keep on urging people to work more. I mean, to be honest, in my view, any, I mean, I look at people in Bangalore, everyone on an average is working 12 hours in any case. If you consider their commute time, um, and there are a lot of other hindrances which are there in our, in our existence, in our work life, which automatically takes 12 hours. So are we suggesting that they should work more? Uh, a lot of people who are in the informal sector, they're working very hard for I mean, they all work 16, 17 hours, but do they really get the commensurate upside in terms of return? What is productivity? Productivity is that a net sum of input that goes into the economy results at much bigger size of output. That's not been the case within India. It's a fact that India has been one of the bottom last four or five ranked in terms of the World Productivity Index. And that's because whether it's infrastructure, whether in way our cities are uh, structured, way the, the enterprise size in India, they are all productivity guzzlers. So there has to be a view taken. Well, hang on, Ritha, forgive me. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. So I want to break this down for our audience in, in like English, basically. You're saying that, our, first of all, and this is this I feel so hard in my heart right now, you're saying our cities are designed so badly that we wind up spending so much time in transit just getting to work that that is eating out of productivity. So I was one step further to say this argument of what can the poor government do? Here it is. This is what poor government can do. You can make it easier for us to access. Look at it. There is a lot that 
a government has to do otherwise we're going to fail our nation i'll give you a simple example india is aiming to be one of the largest economies in the world right we are saying that we are already the top 5 in terms of gdp will soon be top 3 but india is 142nd in per capita income that's your true scenario of what's the problem in productivity in india so which means that what's making us the top 5 by way of gdp is actually the hard work of people but in spite of that we are 142nd in per capita income so when we compare ourselves with germany and japan yes they do have a culture even singapore which is ranked one of the highest in productivity index if a employee goes and works for 8 hours 9 hours 10 hours you can be assured that they have been productive at their work there's a lot of other stuff you know whether it's in terms of uh, the tools that we are using at workplaces the, there are so many people <laughs> come back to you because i want to talk to you about the tools and the, and the level of research the level of tech that we have access to also very importantly the amount of skilling we have in our workforce so if we compare ourselves to a germany what is the level of skills and the level of education we so we are larger workforce how able is it really for it so you so this is what it means so if you are an individual who's putting in 12 hours of work if you have no skill uh, you haven't been skilled then the value per hour is much lower and exactly. that is we're losing out a lot and i'll come back to that i want to bring in sanjay gosh sanjay um you know dr ambedkar fought for labor laws for us a lot of people don't know this in the in the british era he fought for that 8 hour work day he fought for a 1 hour lunch break he fought for 2 10 minute breaks and it was institutionalized back then i mean it's interesting now that we have indian business owners saying hey you know what unless you were put in these many hours and we're not going to pay attention to what the labor laws say uh, we're not going to consider this uh, you know real work Can you put us put it into perspective why you think the labor laws should be valid even for people who are doing white collar jobs in the IT sector or in hospitality or any other job? Well, thank you, Faye, for pointing out something which people don't know or or people don't recognize that uh, before he was the rock star uh, lawgiver of the constitution uh, in the British times, Ambedkar was our first labor minister. and a lot of things like you see today and you take for granted like the industrial disputes act or the minimum wages act or the mines act were all because of ambedkar's uh, uh, efforts in fact for example he actually went to the mines in dharia um, uh, and other places interacted with the mine workers and their families and found out their conditions of 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 working and came back to delhi and incorporated the legal reforms taking into account the the lived experience of workers now this goes back to 1919 and the founding of the indian labor organization international labor organization and there were conventions so the whole fight of labor has been to go from contract to status so let me explain what i mean so by contract for example i am an it company i can by contract force fay to work for 70 hours a week as per our vision of our founder let's say uh, mr x however the fight of labor law has been to take it away from contract and give the status if you are a workman then that status gives you certain rights and one of the rights fay as you rightly pointed out is the right to a regulated work week a regulated work day and all the legislation be it the factories act or the shops and establishments act the minimum wages act the mines act the working journalists act which affects journalists now all of that incorporated into the occupation safety health and working conditions code of 2020 though not implemented till now they all provide for a work day 9 hours 8 hours with a rest period so what this is the status which is being given to an employee it is a hard won status now in in the light of this to say that you know all this should be thrown to the wind and if you go for a 70 hour week or if that is the the target is the hours rather than the output then you actually this battle of decades starting with baba saheb and continuing till now fought by the workers will completely go to the wind now so far as the it sector is concerned we we it's, it's still called the sun the sunrise industry the sun has risen long back 
But there's still a lot of ambiguity whether the labor laws will cover the IT sector employees. But again, the fundamental principle of labor law is welfareism and giving the interpretation which which takes the benefit of the maximum number of people. So I would say that this work week also affects uh, people in the IT who are employees of uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy and his company. No, that's really well said because what happens is also let's talk about the startup culture, right? So there's a startup culture in India right now. Uh, Ritu will be, come, will be familiar with it because it's largely based on a Bangalore where this whole idea that we're building something. We're all going to have to put more than our share. And again, there is a blurring of where the labor laws are and where we're hoping, uh, you know, employees are willing to sort of give their heart and soul. And I think that that tends to be a little dangerous. Um, I want to bring in uh, Dr. Ira Ratta as well. From a mental health point of view, there's the idea of burnout, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, just, just not being able to tend to one's mental health. What is the cost, in your opinion, of working 70 hours a week? Thank you for having me, Faye. First of all, a small confession. As a doctor, I think I'm guilty and a poster child for the 70-hour work week. Been there, done that. Uh, mm -hmm. Had been burnt out as well. And I think that's the physician burnt out, burnout, if you could think about it in our country, right? Why are doctors are often labeled unempathetic because of the hours we work? We're practically the poster children for the 70-hour work week. Speaking of burnout, uh, since my practice is largely folks from MNCs, uh, folks from different walks of life, you know, politicians, uh, doctors, engineers, uh, startup culture folks, everybody uh, resonates that productivity is extremely important to their cause. What gets amiss is the idea around toxic productivity. And I, and I say the word toxic before productivity, which may not sit very well with a lot of people, but it is toxic productivity, which leads to burnout. And classically, how can we identify burnout is when you start losing interest in things which previously you enjoyed, where work brings you no joy, where it's really hard to get yourself out of the bed. And it may not be really a clinical condition, but uh, the WHO has said that the burnout is itself becoming a large pandemic or epidemic for that sorts for people to start struggling. And definitely the aftermath of untreated burnout will lead to anxiety, depression, substance abuse. People cope with uh, alcohol, people cope with the uh, substance just to unwind. And another interesting thing that we find uh, really uh, common in today's population, especially the millennial folks or the new generation, the Gen Z as well, is something that I call revenge bedtime procrastination. That is the longer number of hours you're working, you come back home really tired and at the end of the day, all you tell yourself is I haven't unwinded at all and I need to unwind and I need to do that through scrolling or pretty much watching, binge watching, automatically leading to poor sleep, poor health and then some. So I think 70 hour work week, uh, if it were a mandate for everybody, uh, while in the West there are people moving towards four day work week, uh, and using Japan as an example, since Japan is actually notorious for something called karoshi, which is death by overworking, overburdening, so just random heart attacks and strokes. So I think the burnout is upon us. It is visible. You can see it in your loved ones. Possibly sit down. There's a burnout scale. I tell people, self-analyze. You may be burnt out and you may not even know it. Yeah, it's, it's very well said. We also have Bani Nanda who joins us now. Um, Bani is uh, a chef who is also apparently guilty of working 70 hours. Bani, uh, why did you do it and would you do it again? Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I've actually had a very long day and I'm stuck in Diwali traffic. Uh, it was a 12-hour workday for me because uh, I'm a pastry chef and uh, this is uh, the biggest time of the year. Um, I've actually been on both sides, uh, and that is why I'm very happy to be. Uh, uh, I'm happy to be a, a part of the panel because I was working um, uh, in. I'm not going to take names, but I was working uh, in a very big five-star hotel uh, in New Delhi, and I don't know if everyone is aware of how strenuous FNB is and how strenuous hospitality is, and uh, we were. Um, and honestly, if I look back, I I don't think that these issues were ever addressed. You know, nobody was about 10 years ago. No one was really talking about mental health. No one was talking about exploitation. These things were never highlighted. And uh, 
we were always we were just going with the flow we had energy um you know i was able to stand for 14 hours in a day uh, you know if my head chef asked me you know please ye thoda aur ek ek you know ek party ek catering aayi hai isko bhi karke chale jao um we never realized actually that we were putting in those kind of hours in a week and we were sort of doing it very happily with a lot of enthusiasm um because what i want to highlight is that there was a certain personal gain attached to that kind of hard work um and i was able to uh, grasp you know the market the trends uh, it is very experimental when you're in a kitchen you have to sometimes put in those hours to get a dish right uh, to to gauge market feedback to understand what works and what doesn't work and i was all of uh, 22 and 23 when i was doing this and uh, you know um, as as dr ira pointed out there was a burnout i could feel it i never had time for my family i never had time for my friends i did not have time to you know a, perhaps enter a, a healthy relationship even and but at that time i feel like i was so driven and so motivated at work it never it just never bothered me and i never felt that i was in this toxic environment and maybe i actually was in that toxic environment and uh, you know coming and you know um, fast forwarding maybe now 10 years uh, later now i'm a business owner and i started my own business uh, in 2015 uh, right after working at this hotel um i cannot deny the the kind of um, you know it it gave me a foundation it gave me the confidence to launch my own business and i and i would really do it again if i had to um but saying that uh, you know i have now um i have about um, at miam we have about 50 people working for us now and they come from all walks of society and their different generations and you know sometimes i feel like man i'm too old for this generation like you know what do i do with these gen z kids like how do i crack them like what do they i want them to be happy i want my kitchen to be a happy space right and uh, somewhere down the line i you know in fnb in restaurants uh, we only get four offs a month which is basically one weekly off right and about two years ago i really you know fought with my with my partner i was like no um, you know we have to push for at least six days off uh, a month which is unheard of in fnb so you know every alternate week you would get two weeks off and now i'm pushing for eight days off a month only because i feel like it's already a physically strenuous job you're standing on your feet all day long and you need those two days uh, of rest when you go home but it's sometimes it's just not about your weekly offs it's about how many hours you're putting in a day and i don't have the i will never ask my my team to do that so they're basically working like you know they're working from we have three shifts so say the the 7 am shift is is leaving by 3 or 4 and i have no problem if you've done your work early please leave go catch that movie go live that life go on that date i am not going to you know hold people in my in my kitchen just because they've not uh, finished a shift um so so and but there are also like i also see a lot of these young enthusiastic uh, chefs they you know they come in and they're like chef my shift is over can i please stay longer i'm like yes you can just see if you're okay to do it uh, but it's i have to create that Bye. culture where the yeah yeah i want to address one thing you said that everybody on this panel smiled which is i believe that there's more to you know to actually look at which is you said what am i going to do with these gen z kids right <laughs> and i find very interesting <laughs> that these that the gen z kids so the current 20 year olds who entered the workspace have a very different expectation from right. their jobs from their employers from their life i mean at 22 they're looking at a work life balance i think that those of us who started a while ago didn't we didn't think it was something we even wanted or you know consider that that time okay. and now there is that balance and i think that part of evolution of society is that we have a generation of people who have the ability to ask that but i just want to understand from the panel how are you dealing with these gen z kids sanjay goes you laughed the hardest you tell us i'm sure you're julius <laughs> i'm sure you no no this is a, this is a time to actually admit our hypocrisy see ira said that about doctors and i'm telling you about lawyers also so as they say uh, you know in law there is you know this you have the usual jokes that law is a jealous mistress 
who said law is a bed of roses either it's beds or it's roses so there is this you know there's this myth making of that law is a very very demanding profession and you need a long long hours you can't have any personal life and it's almost like medicine and unfortunately and what we have to keep in mind is you know we had the pandemic and we had uh, you know all all things happening from home and you had the vc system a lot of women who find entry barriers in the legal profession because of this very factor that there's expectation that you have to give time as a jealous mistress concept that a lot of women found it much easy to 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 do their work cut out that whole commute which um, uh, rituparna was talking about to be able to manage the household and also do their work and i thought that was a very good beginning but unfortunately sadly the moment the pandemic was over the lot of courts which spent crores of rupees in setting up the infrastructure to have these uh, uh, video conferencing facilities stopped using it and in fact many courts and tribunals look down or look negatively upon women and male uh, lawyers who would appear through the vc and said that look we are directly we are appearing physically why can't you come physically here of course now the chief justice of india has taken cognizance and recently must have read in the papers he has issued directives to all courts and tribunals to to use this vc alternative the point i'm making is this that you know we are not gen uh, gen z and i was saying this and, and i am guilty why i said I, i was a hypocrite because i was amused when one lady uh, i was interviewing for a junior counsel and one lady and this is never done because we assume that law is sacrifice law is you have to work for pittance etc because no law is applicable to lawyers like we make the laws but minimum wages don't apply to us consumer protection doesn't apply to us no laws apply to us so this lady actually said i want to know what my work hours are and i myself and i'm admitting hypocrisy here was very amused that that here is a lady and 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 i maybe prejudged her but today in context i understand that she had a valid question because yeah. we assume that everyone will you know fall into this age old system that we have made as a jealous mistress you have to keep working but there are these are exactly the entry barriers for women and which is why today we have only three women in the supreme court and woeful number of women high court judges and not even 20 to 30% women lawyers and if we give narayan murthy's formula a go in this country it will be a death knell to the cause of gender justice and more women in employment yeah and, and that's something we should address but first I want to address rimoy chatterjee who said why do you have an all bengali panel i'm not bengali <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm married to Bengali. Because Bengalis are the laziest, and they don't want to walk. <laughs> I'm not a Bengali. I'm married to one, but yes, Bengali that way. I, my lead producer Ira Jha grew up in Calcutta, and she has left half her heart in Calcutta. So this might be symptoms of her seeing the panel at this point. But bringing in Ritu on the point of gender justice, because you know uh, we've got a couple of couple of questions. Rajesh says, "What are the potential uh, potential implications of gender equality and women's participation in the workforce if this is the kind of expectation?" Somebody else said, "You know, uh, work from home was not easy for women because they were doing all the work and they were attempting at the same time uh, to try and get their jobs done while being constantly interrupted." and there is a cost uh, ritu will take us through you know what interruptions due to productivity uh, and women yeah. pay that price when they work from home so yeah. when someone is expecting this kind of commitment ritu what does it do to women participation sure um, i will talk about uh, the women participation but before that i cannot help not talk about the gen z one please yes <laughs> yes the, the gen z uh, uh, the new kids you know they uh, the biggest difference there are many difference but the biggest difference between let's say our generation and this generation is that uh we didn't think we had choice this generation like they swim on choice they need choice for everything so when i say choice what they are saying is that if there is a project uh it, first and foremost they are very purpose led so if they are attached and they are really into the what the organization is doing uh there is no end to what they can end up doing for that organization so they and if there is a project which they think needs them to even stay overnight you know where they have to sleep in office they will do it but if they want now that okay now i want 3 days that i really don't think i am in a mood i am in the zone so be flexible allow me to come and go or let me just take off into the hills they expect to work in an environment where they would have that flexibility and choice to be able to do it that 
So it's very key to know that when you're addressing the Gen Z. Also, um, we as parents, for example, I have worked very long hours all through my life. But let's say when we are viewing our children, which is our future, let's say the future of India, I don't think any one of us are saying that I want my daughter to work as many hours. It's not that I'm not saying that she should not achieve excellence that she should not achieve success, that she should not do great things. But I'm saying, can she live in an environment where she's equipped to achieve the same or higher levels, but putting in less so-called sacrifices or arts? That's productivity, honestly, for a country. So and that's what Gen Z also wants, by the way. Now coming to the point on gender. Let's assume that there is a the, both the, the husband and the wife in a family they work in the corporate world. And uh, they're a young couple. They're probably in their, let's say, early 30s or whatever. You, I mean, whatever, 30, 32 or whatever. Now, both of them are expected to commit 70 hours. Impractical, right? To run a household where both couples are running. Few things are expected. Either the household will go for a toss or their marriage is going to go for a toss or their relationship is going to go for a toss. So as a compromise, one of them will say, listen, I'm going to be the one who's going to spear ahead. Um, the thing, I mean, the thing which actually bothered me a little bit, I know Mr. Naran Murthy is like, he's way up there. I respect him so much is when I heard Ma'am Sudha Murthy say that, look, he has actually worked so many hours. And we all know that she has been the pillar managing the house, which means implicitly we are saying in order for the man to pursue 70 hours, implicitly, I may have misunderstood, that women will have to take a step back. Because yep. a woman being able to also give this, I'm not saying women would not. Like There are many women who have, I'm sure, Fair, you, Era, Bani, myself, we've done that. It, to treat it as a given and only then you will be accepted that workplace, we know, and I completely agree with Shanja, it's going to lead to a discrimination, it would lead to women getting left behind. So we have to strike a balance. I'm somebody who's all in favor that youngsters should work hard, but they should not just work hard for the heck of working hard. I mean, if there is a cause, there is an incentive, there is an upside which is disproportionately high, please do it. Like what I hear Bani saying is that she thinks that she still did not lose out because she gained huge amount of experience because of that effort that she put in because of which she is right now a founder. She's running her own thing and now being able to exercise her own choices and creating her own policies. So, but again, we are all working hard for a better future and that better future is a more productive future, which doesn't mean people yeah. have to slog extra hours. So, yeah, that's my yeah, And I think that that's really interesting, right? Because why do Indians move overseas in such large numbers? Uh, because every hour of work earns more and means more when you work in these markets that are more progressive, right? Either you get overtime or you get time with your family. So basically, your time and your effort means more. I want to read something out that's coming from Rasika Tiwari, who's writing on our comment section, right? She says, and I quote, my mother switched jobs and eventually stopped working so that I had someone at home. Now, I have a very unhealthy family dynamic due to this imbalance. It, it has impacted my long-term mental health. There's nothing more I wish as a child uh, than to have that my father had stayed home more. Uh, and I'll take this to uh, Dr. Ira Datta because this is in your sort of, you know, ballpark about <laughs> mental health and what happens when women are forced to take a step back, when men sort of feel like they can just go out and never have to really be present, never have to really participate because their job involves 80 hours, 90 hours, 100 hours, <laughs> uh, you know, per week. Absolutely. Uh, three things. One, I'm uh, not a Bengali, married to one. That's for starters. <laughs> Second, like Mr. Ghosh said, I'm a full-time online working psychiatrist since the pandemic. And I'm very happy to not have gone back to work. And the choice is not because I need to prioritize home. I have a perfectly functional clinic. I think it's the convenience, the ability to transform the number of hours I work into more productive hours than just long hours. And the third is fun fact, I'm actually a mother to a six-year-old. 
which ties into the question that you're saying uh, the choice of working uh, that a woman chooses at this cusp where she's in a conundrum do i give more time to my child versus do i go and you know earn a livelihood the uh, idea is uh, what do you want to be remembered by your children also as as role models or do you want to be remembered that you know your you you basically took the helm of something now you could be a role model at home as well but that's where men also need to step in as parents and i see more and more men stepping in pay you'd be surprised how many men come on board and how many men come on board and say that how can i be a more present father even if it's for less than number of hours how can i spend more time and the idea dates back to back in the generation men had only one identity which was work and since we women are taking up more work roles i think it's a good challenge that what are we beyond our work hours and so many children have generational trauma of the patriarchal role of the fact that you know daddies went to work earned a living and mummy did the conventional role and uh, you know i seem to run to daddy for all financial advice and i seem to only have his vote counted in the end nothing wrong with it but the whole idea is how can we bring newer generations with a more balanced view of the world and that is why more of us saying that you know i want a balanced lifestyle but i also want to be my career and then some i wish uh, more of us spoke about mental health and the impact it has on children especially young children uh, when mm-hmm. i work my little one says that mama is going to see patients she's a thinking doctor and all i do is sit in the office at home versus my surgeon husband she says he's going to the hospital to fix people's bones and yes he's a doctor too so the idea is very simple if you start off early if you choose you know the roles and stick to it with conviction of course uh, speaking of uh, even the gen z coming back to the gen z because the gen z and the gen alpha are the ones which are coming through I hate the generalization. No, not all Gen Zs are lazy. There are way too <laughs> no, many no, just, Gen Zs. Hang on, hang on. No, no. I don't believe yeah. that Gen Zs are lazy. I think that that's completely wrong. I believe that previous generations of Boomers and Xs have worked really hard to create an environment where Gen Zs can ask for work-life balance at the age of yes. twenty. It is the it it is the effort of many generations of people who brought us to this point. I mean, now we're turning around and saying. Oh, but how can you? But that's what we worked for. We worked for a world where our children don't have to do what we did. I but, think Gen Z is what I, your I, title uh, is. Uh, just yeah. uh, one tiny thought. Uh, I yes. think Gen Z is exactly what the title of today's talk is. They actually work smart, then just completely work hard. With the AI and with so much of you know uh, things at their fingertips, they've started to work smarter than just work harder, like us donkey hours at work. Uh, so hats off to Gen Z as well because they are the future of the country. of course uh, i'm not talking about the life flat moment and you know saying that you could be completely chilling and saying nothing in life needs to be done there needs to be a balance but yeah i know tons of gen z who come to therapy saying that i want to do more be more and then some and the idea of hustle culture was actually invented by the gen z's do more wake up at 4 am start pumping work and then some please mani you were saying something um so so i mean sorry i know we keep coming back uh, to 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 gen z uh, um the whole gen z lot uh, i i do i have nothing against them a lot of them work in my kitchen and a lot of them also drive me up the wall um you know so um there is a certain and i really resonate with uh, uh, you know what ritupana was saying that yes if they are really vested in a task or in a project they are all there for you but sometimes i can't keep you know i can't keep producing amazing fun jobs all the time for them right like there needs to be i mean sometimes you will have a mundane work a uh, work day you know you will just go in and there will just be those orders that you probably did the the, the day before so that there is a struggle over there i'm really trying to navigate through it um but but one of the things i i have i have seen that i think our at least my generation or i could speak for um, simply myself there was a lot more integrity that i brought to the table when i would walk in uh, to work a lot more respect a lot more inte- I, and i'm not and i and i don't mean that you know we have to um, you know put our heads down and just behave like robots and um, you know just take orders but there was a certain respect that you uh, carry to uh, when you went to work you know uh, interestingly bani there is a separate debate happening in our comment section of 
whether or not you're going to actually reach your destination before this uh, live stream gets over and whether you're stuck in <laughs> Bangalore or you're stuck in Delhi. Where are you stuck? I'm in Delhi. I'm in Delhi. So no, <laughs> she's not. <laughs> she's not reaching before the stream gets over. No, no, I, I have. Yes, I have you... uh, I'm sorry. I have parked on the side. I am. Uh, okay. I'm very, very. I'm committed to this. Uh, I was. There's a lot of traffic in Delhi today. It's. It's crazy. <laughs> No, but you know, this is an illustration of, um, you know, of, of, of the kind of man hours or work hours, woman hours, uh, human hours that get wasted on the road um, in India, in all of our cities. And we're doing this across the board in almost all our cities, barring maybe Hyderabad. Uh, traffic is nightmarish. And the amount of time we lose, you know, that time that is spent in the car should either be with family or should be spent at work. But what it does is it drains you, it makes you frustrated, it makes you angry, and that can't be good for productivity or for mental health or for the family that's waiting for you at home when you walk through the door because you don't have the mind space or the energy for anybody uh, for anybody else. Um, I want to go back to uh, such a yes, yes, go ahead. No, I was saying, so there is also a class aspect to this so-called 70 hour thing, right? Yes. So, for example, if you stay in South Delhi, South Bombay, your office is next door, it is very easy to summonize and say you should work uh, 70 hours, 80 hours. But people who are coming in from suburbs, from Pune, from far away, uh, uh, in Delhi, people are coming from Ghaziabad, Shahibabad, it is very difficult. So, uh, you know, so that there are layers and layers to this, uh, to this uh, 70 thing. There's a gender aspect, there's a class aspect. Uh, 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 there are a lot of, lot of aspects to this. Uh, my producers are writing to me saying, I love how this all came back to Gen Z's at the end. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, uh, you know, we have Narayan Bhutti who has that very different perspective who started his business in the 80s, which was a very different India. And, uh, you know, we've now gone to this point, which is also a very different India. So um, peace to all uh, Gen Z's. We love you guys. Many of you are our kids, so we don't have a choice. Uh, like I said, I think that we've worked very hard to get to this point. Uh, lots of people on the this thing is, has, has responded saying that uh, traffic is a waste of time. Traffic is a waste of energy. It's a waste of mind space. Minta says it's good for a change to have three women on the panel. Yay! It's one of our aims. Uh, so, I, and I think that this is such an important thing. Right? I remember when I was... Uh, in a corporate setup, there were women who would leave at bang, 5, 30, 6 o'clock every day because they had full jobs waiting for them at home. They had kids, they had schoolwork, they had groceries, they had dinner, they had, you know, elderly parents or uh, in-laws to look after. And all of this stuff would be waiting for them. While they were working, they were taking calls with maids and drivers and cooks and sort of giving instructions constantly. And there would be this and I remember a male colleague of mine, Ritu, incidentally, who was heading HR, who said, oh, look at this person, not at all committed, leaves at six o'clock every day. And I was like, but what are you doing? You're standing around and talking about politics. How is this a commitment? And, you know, how are you using this yardstick to judge her? The fact that she's here and she's leaving at six means she's regimented her day, which in my mind is a very positive thing. But do you believe that, uh, you know, we talked about women's participation. Do you believe that this creates a negative aspect and let me round it off to anyone who perhaps wants to run a marathon who's going to go back and train or anyone who is going to you know learn French or learn something uh, you know have have a different life after their jobs is going to be seen as non-committed because you're only committed if you're willing to give everything. Hey, I think um, I honestly must submit that while a lot of talk is happening about the 70-hour things and I know that a lot of founders believe uh, and they are entitled to that it's a it's a done thing you do have to work hard but in reality corporate india does have come a long way on this aspect i feel that mm -hmm. there are already changes visible where corporate india is no more uh, assessing appraising reviewing people just in terms of the number of work hours that uh, they are committing themselves to so and hence one, it's, it's, it would be inappropriate for me to actually say that everyone in corporate India is actually, you know, celebrating or is actually judging resources based on how many hours that they're committing to. And the points that you mentioned, they're all valid. I mean, um, the flexibility and I'm, I'm, there's no bias on any gender. I mean, a 
I have seen myself. I have in my team had male uh, uh, colleagues. I have female colleagues. I mean, female colleagues do act very differently in terms of when they leave, as against a male colleague who's ready to stay out longer in office. But that doesn't necessarily mean that a discerning leader who's actually judging people based on final output and outcome actually judge them on actual outcome and not PRs. So yeah. on ground, I think India has already started moving in that direction. And it's no more, honestly, uh, that dramatic where, you know, and I think during COVID, a lot of, um, um, a lot of myths were busted, especially. Yeah. I mean, during COVID, people realized that, uh, I mean, I'm honestly a big believer of work from office. So don't get me wrong, but I also understand and empathize why it is becoming difficult for people in India to work from office and that there is so much of tension whenever somebody mandates that you have to come from office. Like, you know, in Bangalore, let me give you an example. We call the horrid Wednesdays, right? Um, usually Mondays and Tuesdays, because of the hybrid option, people work from home. And on Wednesday, they are back on a, with a bank, they're going to office. And that Bangalore comes to a standstill, which means if they had, if they were supposed to take 30 minutes, now just to do that, they take one and a half hours to reach their mm -hmm. office. Now, these are realities. Now, so I, while I'm a big believer, you need to meet people because that's how you build your social capital. But then this is where productivity gets choked. This is where you're making your your employees and your staff less productive day by day. So I think there are honestly multiple layers to this discussion, which is not so much, no, it's not simple. It's not just about working hard anymore at all. So Ritu, I want, you, I want, you, yeah, I, I, I want you to address the idea of training and skilling and the amount of value, uh, you know, when, because now I'm looking, this is a larger sort of country led thing. And I'll, I'll go back to Sanjay about this as well. Narayan Murthy talked about if we want, we, we need to be doing more for our country, we need to be working more and we have low productivity, what can the government do? But it's really our large workforce is not skilled to compete with the rest of the world, is it? Yeah, 4% of our workforce today has had access to any kind of formal education or training. That's the reality of India. So if that number doesn't change, sometimes we get, especially in discussions like this, and in also the discussion which triggered this, uh, we only think about the formal workforce of India, right? But the India's workforce is the sum total of everyone. Okay. So only 4% of India has had access to any kind of formal training or vocational training. Uh, our electricians, they are electrician because it's genetically transferred skill, not because they are. So <laughs> nobody will pay them more than 50 rupees in any case. So even if that poor guy wants, because they don't have access to it. So that's yeah. something, I mean, skill is a big productivity cousin yeah. in India and we have to table it. And that responsibility is every stakeholders and for sure, Public policy makers have to take cognizance. India made a great progress a few years back by creating a Ministry of Skills. But I must admit that the performance thereon has been extremely um, tepid and not probably to the levels that or what we expected yeah. from a Ministry of Skills to do. Yeah, the whole Skills India project and what 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 it's actually amounted to. Sanjay Ghosh, I want to, you know, at this point, I mean, we also, in the comfort of these conversations, tend to focus on ourselves. But I want to talk about our delivery uh, sort of gig workers, right? Zomato, Swiggy, Blinkit, all of this, uh, you know, that gig working, your Uber, your Ola's, all of these sort of uh, jobs. Well, there is an expectation that you complete a certain amount of this by a certain amount of that in order to be able to make any money while you pay off your uh, fuel and your loans. And there is, we know for a fact, without a shadow of doubt, that these gig jobs right now are simply murder when it comes to the labor laws. And there's this expectation that, hey, life's tough. What is your response to that? Help us understand where we're going as a country if these are the kind of jobs we're creating. Absolutely. And you won't believe it, Faye, while uh, Rituparna was talking, I was actually thinking of the gig workers and you put uh, your words to it. And uh, 
Uh, well, you know, we earlier had the formal economy and the informal economy, and Ritupan was right. The formal economy is just four five percent, and all these several laws of legislation and regulation actually were for the formal economy. Now, what we have, interestingly, is we have a hybrid coming and ev evolving in the form of a gig economy. Now, the whole gig model is where I call it the vanishing point of labor jurisprudence. Because the gig person is neither an employee nor an employer. So the laws were regulating the employer, saying these are the obligations of the employer and these are the rights of the employee. That is the model of legislation, labor legislation so far, right? Mm -hmm. Now you have a third category, which is neither an employer nor an employee, because what they try to say is that, oh, you are an independent service provider. So therefore, you are not our employee. You are not our employee. Uber will tell its people and Zamato Swiggy will tell its people that you are not our employee. You are you, you are an independent person. You can work whenever you want. You can go wherever you go. So therefore, I am not with, ob obliged to pay for you. I am not obliged to have any responsibility towards you. Now, what do you do? What is the work hour of a Swiggy when you make an order of a biryani at 11 at night? Can you say, no, it's, a, it's an eight hour job? And unfortunately, legislation has not dealt with it. There have been certain cases of SWIFT, as you know, in California, Uber in the UK, where these gig workers have gone and sought declarations and were successful in getting declarations from these courts of an employer-employee relationship. Now, in India, unfortunately, the Modi government missed its bus when in 2020 it did the reform. Of course, for the first time, it recognized the concept of gig workers in, in the codes that they brought out. However, all they do... And of course, remember that the codes have still not come into effect. All they do is they say that there will be gig workers, there will be a responsibility to uh, list out gig workers, and there will be a fund in which all these gig companies will contribute. And from that fund, certain amounts will be given to them for their maternity, for insurance, accident, etc. But this is extremely in the realm of vagueness. So you're absolutely right. A growing gig economy is happening where women and men who are going to be employed are already self-exploited or if not exploited by these gig operators. And all this, you know, this comfortable talk we are having, don't affect them, don't address them and don't protect them. Absolutely. Anish says, uh, uh, Anish Korea says construction workers, healthcare service providers, hospitality workers. Bani Nanda is here as a hospitality worker as well. Uh, the sort of commitment that's expected from them, it generally service sector, uh, tends to be very, very hard in India. They work holidays, they work during festivals, they work on Sundays. And there's a toll that that takes on you as well, because you're not, I mean, you're getting a day off. But if it's not the same day off as the rest of your family, what is that? What, you know, what, what is, impact does that have on the quality of your life, Bani? When you work all the festivals, and, and I know this as a journalist, we used to work all the festivals. I used to work, uh, you know, at night till 10, 30, 11 o'clock every day. And so if someone invited me to, to a wedding or to an event, they knew that I couldn't come because I used to be live on television. I just couldn't make it. And after a point, your family sort of takes it for granted, stops inviting you, your friends <laughs> stop calling you because they know you're never going to show up. What impact does that have on your mental health? Um, so uh, when I started Miam, I, I mean, I made sure that, um, see, it's it's not a funded company. It's, it's literally a mom and pop store we're slowly expanding so i can take these uh i can i can take the stand for example diwali day is off holy is off new year's day mm -hmm. i tell my staff please go get drunk get have a hangover don't come to work on the first of of jan so i i want to have uh i i, I understand this and this is the first thing we're actually taught in culinary school that from this day forward you will never be able to enjoy uh, a festival especially for a pastry chef because yeah. everybody remembers you only when they when they're celebrating right like and it's a, it's a great feeling also it's i love being a pastry chef and uh, uh, somewhere down the line um, i can take these i can make these changes in my own organization but i am again less than like 0.5% of fnb owners who would give their staff uh, a holiday on diwali and on holi and yeah but of course like the days leading up to diwali like when the whole world is you know i mean all of delhi is playing uh, tash my 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 uh, chefs have to wake up and we all have to come in at 7 
a.m. in the morning, you know. So there is a, uh, uh, it, it's quite sad. Maybe yeah. after 15 years of being a chef, maybe now I feel like there are some, uh, some days of Diwali that I can enjoy now. I mean, I've had to earn that. Yeah, it's very, very well said. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ira, I'm going to give you as, as the mental health professional. You know, here for me, this was very interesting because when I started Beetroot, when I started my team outside of television, uh, we used to do this thing where we say, hey, I'd say, you know what? And we put in two, two philosophies into the company, which meant a lot to me. One is that family always comes first. If you have a family member who is ill, if you have a family member who needs you, if there's a wedding, if there's something you need to do with your family, go to it we'll figure it out uh family cannot be replaced and so you should not attempt to you know put work first secondly we would take time off so we would actually write it out saying hey we're taking the day off because we're not here if you hear from us then really something horrible has happened which is when we will disturb you but otherwise we're all just chilling and also what happens mm -hmm. in news is that festival days tend to be low news days so there's really no point in making someone work on that day but it's terrifying because the culture for me uh you know for 20 years in news is to always be on that something will happen and you have to be reachable uh so then we started telling a few people not to get drunk so that in case someone needs to write something, you have to be available and sober. So there's always one designated news writer on the team who's available and sober in case something happens. But uh, how important is it, uh, Ira Danta, to, um, you know, to give people not just time, but also time with family and time with family that coincides with everybody else's time off? I actually want to thank uh, Mr. Murthy for stirring up this uh, debate of introspection within for all of us, isn't it? We've all sat down and tried to analyze what are our real value systems. Is family my real value, right? Is balance my value? Is uh, just work my value? Uh, so phase one, very interesting thing uh, based on what you're saying that I ask people in therapy and these are typically folks who run companies like Ritupurna and you know, people who have their identities like uh, Mr. Ghosh tied up to their job titles. I always ask them, who are you sans minus your work title. Who are you if you had all the money in the world, didn't have to work for a single day in the rest of your life and provided, yes, money is one of the main things that most of us work for, what would you do with the rest of your time? And then I asked them, why aren't you doing that right now? Because everybody waits for retirement and that's the conventional idea taught to us that you work, you retire, you play golf, you chill and then tata bye bye to the world, right? So I think uh, what you have said and what Ritwana just said and what all of us are talking about today and I too in my own uh, small organization have the same set of rules to the therapists who work under me. I tell them, listen, you're not supposed to take a call beyond your work hours. Just say no. Say you're on off time. I personally put my phone off as well. So I think it's great that you're setting boundaries and we as Indians are horrible at setting boundaries, not only with people outside but within. So yes, cheers to us talking about boundaries. Cheers to yes. Bani saying that, you know, you can get six days or uh, six days in a month off, which is a great starting point, I must say. And cheers to even doctors wanting to do things beyond their roles, to advocates, to entrepreneurs having identity beyond work. So I think Mr. Murthy has done us all a great favor of a moment of reflection, mindful introspection. And I really thank him for that, for stirring up this entire inner debate, if not external. So, you know, so here's my take, right? I spent a lot of time thinking about Mr. Murthy's comment. Um, what has Narayan, what is Narayan Murthy's contribution to our country? A lot. I mean, I grew up in Bangalore in the 80s. Um, Pre-Enforces Bangalore and post-Enforces Bangalore, completely different. He changed the economy. He changed lives. He changed families uh, with that one company. And it also set off like many other things. Um, he also started in the 80s, like we keep talking, you know, to Gen Z's and to millennials. Um, I think um, we need to acknowledge the boomers and what they have done and the contribution they have made. And so he has a certain perspective that we maybe disagree with, but we can't entirely cancel him. And I think that that's unfair. It's really important for us to pick up the nuance of someone's perspective and where this person is, go is coming from. Uh, to our Gen Z colleagues uh, who are in our workplaces and sharing space with us. We're trying to be better, I promise you. Every millennial I speak to, including the ones on this panel, are trying to understand, trying to be better because we know that what you're 
looking for is the right thing. We know that a better work-life balance is important, but we are all Narayan Murthy's in our own right in the sense that we come from a certain culture and a background and we're trying to also evolve with the times. We're trying to build a future in which nobody has to do 80, 90 hours unless you really want to, and it's your liver to sort of burn. But no, you shouldn't, it shouldn't be expected from you at the end of the day. Uh, you know, they, they call it workaholics for a reason. You're actually burning your own blood and liver of choice. Um, and that should be a matter of choice. I think everybody on the panel agrees that it should be a matter of choice. If you choose and that's, that's how you want to live your life, and that's okay. But it should not be the benchmark. It should not be the median uh, sort of bell curve at which we sort of measure everybody else. If you, if you do what is expected of you, which is this is your KRA and this is your salary. You should be able to take home your salary and be treated with respect if you have performed your job. Nobody should expect you to sort of outshine everybody else. And I want to put down here that there is a terrible need for creation of more jobs in this country because we keep talking about this large workforce that we have, but we're not creating jobs for this workforce. And so we're just expecting them. It's a hunger games. You want them to just fight each other to the death and you know sort of like give up life and love and everything else and make themselves available all the time and that's the only way to do it no the only way to do it is to create more jobs so that everybody's hours are respected and everybody can create more value um aman Peshavri, thank you so much uh for giving us the thousand rupees the money will go towards paying salaries and being more productive. <laughs> Aman says, can we not increase productivity by educating the population with more skills? Exactly. That is what uh, Ritu was saying as well. Better skilling will actually mean everybody's one hour pays better. And so we will increase productivity instead of like squishing everybody under the wheel, uh, you know, which is which is what we're doing right now. I want to thank my panel for joining us. Uh, it's been amazing. And I really enjoyed how respectful and intellectual um, and wonderful this conversation has been. Thank you so much for making time. I do hope we can do more of this because these are actually areas in which a lot of India's reality is not in the politics, but in this, in, you know, in labor, in laws and things like that. Uh, Ritu, it is a pleasure to see you after so long. Sanjay, you as well. Uh, good to be speaking to uh, Dr. Ratha and Bani Nanda. Bani, I wish you a really good festive season. Good luck. Thank you. I Kill it. Uh, and I also hope you get enough sleep and some time to watch a movie or two. Uh, <laughs> have a really, have a really good festive season here on our YouTube page. We're going to keep bringing you videos. We're increasing the frequency of our videos. Leave us a comment. Uh, send us some love. We're trying. Uh, you know, we're also trying to make a business work. Uh, we're trying to make a business viable. So uh, send us love, uh, guys. Thank you so much. Try and get some time over the festive season to spend with family. Much love. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.